Good afternoon. I'm Judith Rose, Deputy Cultural Counselor of the French Embassy and Deputy Director of Villa Albertine. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to celebrate a monument of French and world literature. Marcel Proust passed away just one century ago on November 18, 1922 leaving behind a work as famous as it is intimidating, In Search of Lost Time, à la recherche du temps perdu, in French. This seven-volume novel, seven volumes and 1.2 million words, which probably makes it the longest novel in the history of literature, has since then been studied, translated, adapted, and has inspired authors and artists all around the world. It would be too long to list all the recent projects centered around Proust's work, but it's interesting to note that they touch all fields of creation, from theater to children's literature, including music, cinema, and comics. It is this vitality and diversity that we want to celebrate with our Proust weekend. French Proust specialist Jean-Yves Tadier seems to have given a perfect definition of our program when he said, everyone has their own Proust. Indeed, everyone has a relationship from near or far with his work, including, and probably especially those who haven't read it. Who has never encountered the famous Proust questionnaire? Who has not identified with his Madeleine episode and experienced the childhood memories that come back with a certain food? Who hasn't one day resolved to read the whole of In Search of Lost Time with or without success? And of course, our Albertine bookstore, which so many of you are familiar with, is named after his work. We have therefore imagined an eclectic program, which we hope will be interesting for fine connoisseurs of Proust, as well as total novices. We started our first day this morning with workshops for children in partnership with Edition Animé. This afternoon, we'll have the opportunity to attend a roundtable discussion moderated by Professor André Benaïm and entitled The Many Ways of Proust, Translator Lydia Davis, Professor Ruben Gallo, and Director Mary Zimmerman will speak to us about the translation, adaptation, and reception of Proust's work. André Benaïm will then offer us a dive into cinema with his performance Proust in Hollywood, and will end on a high note with a performance by Véronique Aubouy, who has come from France to offer us a summary of In Search of Lost Time in one hour. <laughs> To kick off this great program, we are delighted to welcome comedian Jim Fletcher. Jim Fletcher is an actor, writer, artist, and a founding member of the New York City Players Theatre Company with Richard Maxwell. He's currently working on Maxwell's Field of Mars and with the Wooster Group on Richard Foreman's Symphony of Rats. Uh, he has worked with Sarah Mitchelson, Elevator Repair Service, Tim Etchells of Forced Entertainment, Pascal Rambert, Paul Devaux, and many others. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining us today. Together with Jim, in a nod to Villa Albertine, we have chosen an excerpt from the second volume of In Search of Lost Time, which recounts the meeting between the narrator and one of Proust's most elusive and enigmatic characters, Albertine. Before handing over the mic to Jim, I'd like to warmly thank all the speakers and performers who agreed to take part in this Proust weekend, as well as the Villa Albertine teams, in particular the book, partnerships and communication teams, as well as the bookstore team, of course. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the reading. Hello. Hi, how are y'all doing? Um, 
I, I, I've never been introduced as a comedian before, but, but I think I, <laughs> but I kind of, I fancy myself a bit of a comedian, but yes, an actor. Um, I want to give a little background for this, just so that it can be helpful. And I would love to say, just interrupt me and uh, ask if uh, you have any questions with this. But um, this is this part takes place in a seaside town called Balbec, where the narrator is spending the summer season with his grandmother. Although he's a young man, adult, literary man. Um, and uh, he's, they're staying together at the Grand Hotel in Balbec. And he's made a few friends uh, since he's been there, but not as many as he wants to make. Um, he has uh, San Lu, who is about his age. And at first, uh, the narrator was sort of a fan of San Lu, but then San Lu became a fan of him. And then there's um, El Steer. The painter, he's a great painter, not yet famous, but soon to be very famous painter. I uh, pronounce him Elster sometimes as if he were had an English name, Elster, Elster. Okay, so there's saint Lou and Elster, that's his male friends that are mentioned here. And then there's the gang of girls. There's this, uh, he spends a lot of time, his hotel is right on the Esplanade. So there's the seaside and there's the Esplanade. Uh, I guess that's like a boardwalk. Uh, and. Um, there's this thing he calls the gang of girls. He, almost, he speaks of it like it's an organism, like it's an animal, uh, the gang of girls. And he's always watching for the gang of girls to come by. And um, they spend some time in the, near the sea. They spend some time going along the esplanade. And he loves them because they're so wild. They're so different from everybody else in the town, even the way they move their bodies because they're into sports, which was uh, apparently sports culture maybe was a new thing at the time, he seems to suggest, especially for girls. And um, so sometimes he sees them carrying golf clubs or sometimes he sees them pushing bicycles and he th it's pretty, like wild. And um, <laughs> it's, it's great. And the way they talk, they speak in slang, they're a little rude, they don't seem to care and they really work as a group. Then, he's, then he starts identifying particular ones of the gang of girls. I'm telling you this because it's, it's not in the excerpt that I'm reading, um, but it's necessary to it. And uh, he starts identifying them one by one. It reminds me of Jane Goodall when she was with the, uh, the great apes. And she started, first they're a group of apes and then she starts naming them. And, and, um, and there's uh, uh, several ones in particular. Uh, he knows them all. Uh, uh, and then, but there's one in particular who has a, a Mark, uh, so she sort of stands out from the other ones as he also considers her the most beautiful, although he considers them all extremely beautiful to him and um, wants to know them all. Um, but the one, he, he, Elster, his painter friend, he finds out one day, knows this one. He's sitting in Elster's house saying, um, uh, wishing he could be by the sea because he knows the gang of girls is about to show up. And the, the one with the mark on her face um, just walks right up with her uh, uh, golf clubs, I think, and, um, and shakes Elster's hand. And so he's like, you know her? And, and what's her name? And her name is Albertine. So after missing uh, an opportunity to meet her at one point, then he asked Elstir to throw a, uh, a salon in his painting studio because he's really highly regarded even in the town of Belbec. Uh, so just for the purpose of being introduced to Albertine, okay. But when this opens, he's uh, having lunch, uh, as he always does at the Grand Hotel, right along the seaside. Okay. I might migrate, searching for light. <laughs> um, uh, at the end of lunch, I was inclined now to stay on as the tables were being cleared. And if it was a moment at which the little gang of girls could not be expected to pass, my eyes looked on things other than the sea. Since seeing such things in the watercolors of Elstir, I enjoyed noticing them in reality, 
glimpses of poetry as they seemed, knives lying askew in halted gestures, the tent of a used napkin within which the sun has secreted its yellow velvet, the half-emptied glass showing better the noble widening of its lines, the undrunk wine darkening it but glinting with lights inside the translucent glaze seemingly made from condensed daylight volumes displaced and liquids transmuted by angles of illumination. The deterioration of the plums, green to blue, blue to gold, in the fruit dish already half plundered. The wandering of the old-fashioned chairs, which twice a day take their places again around the cloth draping the table as though it is an altar for the celebration of the sanctity of appetite with a few drops of lustral water left in oyster shells, like little stone fonts. I tried to find beauty where I, I had never thought it might be found, in the most ordinary things, in the profound life of still life. Some days after the departure of Saint Lou, when I had managed to prompt El Steer to hold a little reception at which I would be able to meet Albertine, I was rather sorry that the charm and elegance, albeit momentary, on which I was complimented as I stepped out of the Grand Hotel, which were the result of a long rest and extra expenditure on appearance, could not be reserved, along with the prestige of El Steer, for my conquest of some other more interesting person, rather than being lavished on Albertine and the pleasure of making her acquaintance. My mind saw this pleasure, now that it was assured, as being not worth very much. But the will in me did not share that illusion for an instant, being the persevering and unwavering servant of our successive personalities, hidden in the shadows, disdained, forever faithful, working unceasingly and without heeding the variability of our self making sure it shall never lack what it needs. When a journey we have longed to make begins to become a reality, and the mind and sensibility are starting to wonder whether it is really worth the effort, the will which well knows that if it turned out the journey could not be made, these feckless masters would immediately long for it to become possible again, lets them loiter in front of the station, having their say, hesitating until the last minute, while it makes sure of buying the tickets and getting us into the train before departure time. It is as invariable as the mind and sensibility are changeable, but because it is silent and never gives its reasons, it seems almost non-existent. All the other parts of our self march march to its tune unawares, though they can always see clearly their own uncertainties. So my mind and sensibility set up a debate on how much pleasure there might be in making the acquaintance of Albertine, while in front of the mirror I considered the vain and fragile charms that they would have preferred to preserve unused for some better occasion. But my will did not lose sight of the time at which I had to leave. And it was El Steer's address that it gave to the coachman. My mind and sensibility, now that the die was cast, indulged in the luxury of thinking it was a pity. If my will had given a different address, they would have been in a state of panic. On arriving at El Steer's a little later, I thought at first that, oh yeah, her Albertine's last name is uh, Simonet. On arriving at El Steers a little later, I thought at first that Mademoiselle Simonet was not in the studio. There was only a young lady sitting down wearing a silk dress, bareheaded, but whose magnificent hair was unknown to me, as were her nose and complexion, and none of which could I recognize the being I had constructed out of a young girl walking along the esplanade, pushing a bicycle and wearing a toque. Albertine it was, however, Yet, even after realizing this, I paid no attention to her. On going into a fashionable gathering as a young man, one takes leave of the person one was. One becomes a different man, each new salon being a new universe in which, subject to the law of a new moral perspective, we focus acute attention on individuals, dances, games of cards, as though they were destined to be part of our life forever, though we will have forgotten them by the following morning. 
being obliged in order to come eventually to a chat with Mademoiselle Simonet to follow a route that was not of my own design, which reached a first destination in front of Elstir before leading me on to other groups of guests to whom I was introduced, then along the buffet where I was handed and where I ate strawberry tarts while pausing to listen to music that had just begun to be played. I found myself giving to these various episodes the same importance as to my introduction to Mademoiselle Simonet, which was only one among their sequence and which I had by now completely forgotten had been a few minutes before the sole object of my presence there. Does not the same thing happen in busy everyday life to our truest joys and greatest sorrows? We stand among other people and the woman we adore gives us the answer, favorable or fatal, that we have been awaiting for a year. We must go on chatting Ideas lead to other ideas, making a surface beneath which, rising only from time to time, barely perceptible, lies the knowledge, very deep but acute, that calamity has struck. Or, if it is happiness rather than calamity, we may not remember until years later that the most momentous event of our emotional life happened in a way that gives us no time to pay close attention to it or even to be aware of it almost during a fashionable reception, say, despite the fact that it was in expectation of some such event that we had gone to it. At the moment when Elstir suggested I go with him and be introduced to Albertine, who was sitting a little way away, I finished a coffee eclair and inquired with interest of an old gentleman whom I had just met and to whom I saw fit to offer the rose he had admired in my buttonhole about certain agricultural shows in Normandy. <laughs> this is not to say that the introduction that followed gave me no pleasure or that it did not have a character of some gravity in my eyes. The pleasure, of course, I did not experience till a little later, back at the hotel when, having been alone for a while, I was myself again. Pleasures are like photographs. In the presence of the person we love, we take only negatives, which we develop later at home, when we have at, at our disposal once more our inner dark room, the door of which it is strictly forbidden to open while others are present. Unlike the awareness of my pleasure delayed for some hours, the gravity of the introduction was perceptible to me at the time. At a moment of introduction, though we feel an immediate gratification, though we know we are now in possession of a voucher valid for future pleasures of, us, of the sort we have been seeking for weeks past, we also sense that its possession puts an end not only to our wearisome searching, a reason for unmitigated joy, but also to the existence of a particular person, the figment created in our imagination and magnified by the fretful fear that we might never come to be acquainted with that person. At the moment when our name sounds in the voice of our introducer, and especially if the latter accompanies it as Elstir did with words of praise, a moment as sacramental as the one in pantomimes when the genie commands a person to turn all of a sudden into someone else. The girl, the girl we have been longing to approach vanishes. For one thing, how could she go on being the same since by the very attention she is obliged to give to our name and display to our person the conscious gaze and unknowable mind that we had been vainly seeking in her eyes, which were infinitely distant from us yesterday and which we thought our own eyes, wandering, unfocused, desperate, divergent, would never manage to meet, have just been miraculously and simply replaced by our own image, pictured as by a smiling mirror. If our own reincarnation as something that formerly seemed as distant as possible from ourselves is what most transforms the unknown girl to whom we have just been introduced, her own form is still rather vague, and we may wonder whether she will turn into a goddess, a table, or a bowl. 
With the agility of a wax modeler who, as we watch, can make a bust in five minutes, the few words she is about to speak will rough out her form and give it something definitive, eliminating every previous hypothesis elaborated by our desire and imagination. Before she attended El Steer's little party, Albertine was no doubt not quite the mere phantom that a passerby becomes, whom we have barely glimpsed, of whom we know nothing, and who may haunt our life thereafter. Her being related to Madame Bonton had already restricted these marvelous hypotheses by blocking off one of the channels via which they might have proliferated. As I came closer to the girl and gradually knew her better, my acquaintance with her proceeded by subtraction as each part of her made out of imagination and desire was replaced by a perception worth much less, although to each of these perceptions was added a sort of equivalent in human relations of that continuing dividend which finance companies go on paying after the redeeming of the original share. Her name and her family connections had fixed a first limit to my suppositions. Another was set by the pleasantness of her manner as I stood beside her, noticing again the beauty mark on her cheek just under the eye. And I was astonished to hear her use the adverb perfectly instead of completely when talking of two people, one of whom she said was perfectly mad, but really quite nice, and the other a perfectly common person and perfectly boring. <laughs> Inelegant as it was, this usage of perfectly suggested a level of cultivation far above what I would have imagined to be that of the bacchant with the bicycle, the orgiastic muse of the golf course. And after that initial metamorphosis, Albertine was of course to go through many other changes in my eyes. The qualities and faults of any person as they appear in the foreground of the face will be arranged in a different order if we come upon them from another angle, as the landmarks of a city seen lying along a straight line in a random order are shuffled into different dimensions of depth and exchange among themselves their relative sizes when glimpsed from another point of view. At the beginning, I thought Albertine looked somewhat intimidated rather than ruthless. She seemed proper and not ill-mannered, judging by statements she made about every one of the girls I mentioned to her, such as, she's very fast, or she's perfectly unladylike. And the focal point of her face was one of her temples, flushed and unpleasant to look at, instead of the singular expression in her eyes, which until then had been the thing about her that had always been in my thoughts. But this was only my second sight of her, and there would undoubtedly be a sequence of other points of view from which I would have to see her. To achieve accurate knowledge of others, if such a thing were possible, we could only ever arrive at it through slow and unsure recognition of our own initial optical inaccuracies. However, such knowledge is not possible, for while our vision of others is being adjusted, they, who are not made of mere brute matter, are also changing. We think we have managed to see them more clearly, but they shift. And when we believe we have them fully in focus, it is merely our older images of them that we have clarified, but which are themselves already out of date. Yet, whatever disappointments it is bound to bring, that way of approaching what one has glimpsed, what one has had the leisure to imagine, is the only wholesome one for the senses, the only one that keeps them in appetite. What monotony and boredom color the lives of those who, from laziness or timidity, drive directly to the houses of friends whom they have come to know without first having imagined them? without ever daring to dally along the way with what they desire. On my way home from El Steer's little reception, I thought about it, remembering the coffee eclair I had finished before, uh, remembering the coffee eclair I had finished before, uh, before letting him take me to meet Albertine, the rose I had given to the old gentleman, all these details which, selected without our knowledge by the circumstances, continue in their special haphazard arrangement, uh, constitute in their special haphazard arrangement our picture of a first meeting. It was this same picture that some months later I had the impression of seeing from another point of view, one very remote from my own, 
and of realizing that it had not existed only for me. One day, as I spoke to Albertine about our first meeting, to my amazement, she reminded me of the eclair, the flower I had given away, everything that I believed not to be of importance only to, my, to myself, but to have been noticed only by me. And yet there they were, transcribed in a version I had not suspected existed in the mind of Albertine. Back at the hotel on that first day, when I could focus on the memory I had taken away with me, I saw the conjuring trick that had been done and how I had spent some time chatting with a person who, by the magician's sleight of hand, had been substituted for the girl I had watched so often along the esplanade and who had nothing in common with her. This I could have suspected in advance as the young girl on the esplanade had been my own creation. Even so, since I had identified her with Albertine in my conversations with Elster, I now felt a moral obligation toward the real Albertine to keep the promises of love made to the imaginary one. <laughs> Betrothed by proxy, we feel constrained to marry the intermediary. Besides, though my life was now at least temporarily free of an anguish, any recurrence of which could have been quickly canceled by the memory of her properness, the expression perfectly common, and the flushed temple, this memory now roused in me a different sort of desire, which, though sweet and quite painless, rather like a brotherly feeling, was capable of becoming in time just as dangerous by giving me a constant need to kiss this new person whose good manners, shyness, and unexpected availability curbed the feudal surges of my imagination but gave rise to a touching gratitude. Also, since memory immediately begins to take snapshots that are quite independent of one another, abolishing all links and sequence among the scenes they show in the collection of them that it displays, the latest does not necessarily obliterate the earlier ones. Beside the unremarkable and touching Albertine with whom I had chatted, I could see the mysterious Albertine against the backdrop of the sea. Both were now memories, pictures, that is. Neither seemed truer than the other. The final image of my introduction to her that afternoon was that when I tried to remember the little beauty mark on her cheek just below the eye, I realized that after my first sight of her, when she had greeted Elstir in passing, I had seen it on her chin. Each time I saw Albertine, I noticed she had a beauty mark, and my misguided memory moved it about her face, sometimes putting it in one place, at other times in another. Disappointed as I was with Mademoiselle Simonet, a young girl not very different from others I knew, I consoled myself with the thought, uh, just as my disappointment with the church of Balbec had not affected my desire to, do, to go to Quimperlet, Pont Avant, and Venice, that even though she had not lived up to my expectations, at least through her I would be able to meet her friends in the little gang. I thought at first that I was going to fail in this aim, as she was going to be staying in Balbec for quite a while, as I was myself, I had decided that it would be better not to seek her out too directly, but to wait for an opportunity when circumstances would bring us together. However, if that were to happen every day, it was very likely she would do no more than greet me without stopping, and by the end of the season, I would be no further forward. Not many days later, one morning when it had rained and was almost cold, I was accosted on the esplanade by a young girl with a little flat hat and a muff, so different from the person I had seen at Elstir's reception, that it appeared to be a feat beyond the power of the human mind to recognize her. My mind, however, managed it. But only after a second's surprise, which I think did not escape Albertine's notice. Also, Remembering the good manners which had so struck me, I was now surprised by their opposite, her coarse tone and her little gang manners. And then her temple was no longer the reassuring optical center of her face, either because I was now on her other side or because her hat concealed it or because its flush was not constant. What weather, she said. Balbeck's endless summer is just a great joke, of course. 
Don't you do anything here? You're never seen at the golf course. You're never seen at the golf course or dances in the casino, and you're never out riding a horse either. You must find it all a great bore. You don't think that people who just stay on the beach are a bit silly? Oh, I see. You like just lazing about. Well, you got plenty of time. I can see you're not like me. I love all sports. Weren't you, you weren't at the races at La Sonia? We went by trolley, and I can understand why you wouldn't want to set foot in a rattle trap like that. It took two hours. I could have gone there and back three times on my bike. Uh, I had admired saint Lou for referring quite naturally to the little local train as the slow coach because of all the twists and turns of the line, but her fluency with words like trolley and rattle trap disconcerted me. I sensed in it a mastery of forms of speech in which I was afraid she must recognize my inferiority and for which she would despise me. At that time, the wealth of synonyms current among the little gang for that little train had not yet been revealed to me. When she spoke, Albertine held her head still, keeping her nostrils tight and barely moving her lips. This gave her a nasal drawl, perhaps partly composed of the accents of provincial forebears, a youthful affectation of imperturbable Britishness, the coaching of a foreign governess, and a blocked nose. <laughs> This pronunciation, which once she got to know people better, disappeared and was replaced by a more naturally girlish manner, could have sounded quite unpleasant, but I found the peculiarity of it enchanting. When I had not seen her for a few days, I could excite myself by repeating, you're never to be seen at the golf course, with the nasal twang she used, speaking straight at me without moving her head. And I thought there could be no one more desirable in the whole world. That morning, we were one of the couples who here and there punctuate the esplanade with their momentary meetings, pausing long enough to exchange a few words before separating to take up again their two diverging trajectories. I took advantage of this brief immobility to make a thorough check of the place where the beauty mark was to be found. <laughs> Just as a phrase of Van Toy that had delighted me in the sonata, and which my memory kept moving from the andante to the finale, until the day when, with the score in hand, I was able to find it and localize it where it belonged in the scherzo, so the beauty mark, which I had remembered on her cheek, then on her chin, came to rest forever on her upper lip, just under her nose. In the same way, we are astonished to come upon a stanza we know by heart, but in a poem where we did not realize it belonged. Thank you. <laughs>